Five jobs that scientists can do working remotely. You can still contribute to science in many different ways. You don't have to be stuck in a lab for the rest of your life. My name is Jack. In my day job, I do career counseling. I'm a scientist, college professor, working to over a thousand students at various stages of their studies, as well as many prospective high school students. The first and most common question I'm asked, do scientists get stuck in a lab for the rest of their lives? This is a bit of a stereotype. No one forces scientists to be in the lab. We are not trapped there against our will. Anyone who is in a lab needs to be covered by insurance. If you don't want to be in there, it's way cheaper for the lab or for the employer to say, look, just leave because you are costing us a lot of money just by being in this environment. And if you don't enjoy the lab environment, you can still contribute to science in many different ways. This wide article really highlights the remarkable stuff scientists get done as they work from home. Let's go through five jobs or tasks scientists can do physically away from the lab, starting with five data analysis. You collect all of the data and it is sitting in a spreadsheet and you can work on this on your computer at home or on a laptop, wherever all that data has been collected. Then you move on to the analytical phase, which then takes maybe a week or two location independent. You can go to a conference, you can travel overseas and still work on that data without having to physically be in a lab. Scientists who don't spend enough time in analyzing that data and just think I need to collect more and more data all the time, they're actually wasting a lot of mental and physical energy because it's the analytical phase that will inform you what the next step should be. And that is a much more iterative and productive way of working in science, not linear. It should be lab experiment, look at the data, reevaluate, tweak a few things, try the lab experiment slightly differently again, optimize. So it should be cyclical rather than linear. During the pandemic, during 2020, there were many famous examples of scientists still doing great analysis offsite. For instance, this story highlights a scientist Coralie Adams, who was watching her spacecraft approach a rocky asteroid 140 million miles from Earth. They were doing this mission control from home. Number four, we can write. So much of the scientific pursuit relies upon communicating and disseminating the information to a broader audience. And that is part of the reason I'm doing this podcast, part of the reason I'm doing this video series on YouTube is to talk about science to the general public to some mixed results, I have to say. I'm going to touch back on this later on. If you do the experiment, but no one knows the result, you may as well not have done the experiment. During the pandemic, when people were forced to not be physically present in a lab, over 13,000 papers were written around COVID-19 research and over 3,000 preprints related to COVID-19 research have been shared. If you get things written, you can do it anywhere. I don't have to be in the office to do that. I don't have to be in a lab. This is not just writing research papers. There are many different types of writing related to science. For example, you could be a technical writer, the manuals and instructions for scientific equipment, writing sales copy for scientific companies trying to sell drugs or sell equipment or sell procedures. Not to mention if you are an editor of a research journal and you're going through reading all of these people's research article submissions and vetting the process of peer review where multiple scientists in the field or who my experts help judge the quality of a manuscript, this can all be very much done remotely. Number three, clinical research associate or coordinating clinical research. With clinical trials that had to happen with lots of human participants, the actual trial itself, once it's up and running, the patients have all signed up, they know where to go, the drugs have all been ordered, collecting samples and doing the tests is very procedural, it is following a recipe, but to get it to that stage requires months if not years of planning by people who work in roles called in Australia clinical research associates or clinical trials coordinators, you're doing a lot of administrative coordination, you're doing a lot of paperwork, you're writing ethics applications for animal research, you're also talking to clinicians, talking to doctors, then talking to hospitals and coordinating with the research group. All of this liaising across multiple sites, different hospitals, different states, different locations and different labs can all really be most effectively done away from a lab environment because you need good communication, you need a good computer, you need access to all the files, you need to be able to hop on a Zoom call very quickly to talk to all these different people in different locations. Clinical trials coordinators, they often don't work in a lab full time. They may be two or three days in a lab and the rest of the time they're trying to manage all of this paperwork because once that clinical trial is ready to go and you've recruited all of these participants, could be 50 participants or could be thousands of participants, that needs to be airtight. So when the trial actually starts, the people running the trial are just following very well thought out and planned out protocols. And you can't actually do all of that planning 
if you're in the lab the whole time. What else can scientists do that's not in a lab? Number two, computational science or coding. If you're developing an algorithm, making a new program or a new user interface for some type of program that other scientists will use, all of this can be done remotely because it's based at a computer. I will concede that for computer scientists who work with data sets that can be done using machines, sure, they can do this remotely even more readily than other branches of science. In my field of biology, the people who work in computational science and work in bioinformatics, they still need access to wet labs, the people who work in wet labs, because they're working with the experimental flocks and tubes and cells that would then generate the data that can feed to those people who work in genomics, who work in bioinformatics. The two go hand in hand. But if you're not a fan of being stuck in a lab, consider using computer science and applying that toolkit towards the most complex data set man has ever known, and that is biology. So that is yet another job, the number two job that you don't have to be physically in a lab to do. And the number one job that scientists can do when they're not physically in a lab is teaching. This video on YouTube or this podcast that you're listening to hopefully is a testament to that, educating people about science and communicating about the different misconceptions people may have about science entirely online, entirely from my home. I'm not physically in a lab right now. Most of the videos on my channel, I'm not physically based in a lab. Not to mention once you become a college professor, let's say, and you start teaching science, most of those classes happen in lecture theaters or in small rooms. They are not physically in the lab either. All of these scientists are trying to run back from these teaching classrooms into the lab to get more of their experiments done. So they're not trying to run away from the lab. They're actually trying to spend even more time in the lab than their schedule would allow. So again, I reiterate, although there are five jobs I've just talked about that scientists can do when they're not physically in the lab, most scientists are desperate, clamoring to get back into the lab because that is where they will make the next breakthrough. And it's very exciting to be in that environment. The fact that this question is the most common question I'm asked, if I'm a scientist, do I get stuck in a lab for the rest of my life? That speaks a little to the fear people have about autonomy in their work, about feeling a certain amount of flexibility, certain amount of freedom in choosing the type of work you do and where you might be able to do it. I could say the same thing about, hey, I don't want to be stuck in an office for the rest of my life. Feeling stuck, I guess, is the main anxiety, not necessarily stuck in a specific location. No one wants to feel like they're not moving upwards and they don't have choice and flexibility in their careers. My name is Jack. See you next time around.